Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us for our event today. My name is Isabella Tabarovsky. I'm a senior program associate at the Canon Institute. I, um, a couple of announcements before uh, we start. I encourage you to stay up to date on the latest Canon Institute events and publications by visiting our website and subscribing to our two blogs, Focus Ukraine and the Russia File, as well as our podcast, Canon X and the Russia File. Please visit our Hindsight Upfront Ukraine collection on the Wilson Center website for the latest news and analysis focused on Ukraine. If you'd like to ask a question during the course of this conversation, please submit it via email to canon at wilsoncenter.org, via Twitter at Canon Institute, or on our Facebook page at any time. Please include your name and affiliation when sending your questions. I will begin by introducing our first speaker, uh, and giving him an opportunity uh, to deliver his remarks. And then we'll go uh, one after the other before we turn to questions. So let me begin by introducing Michael Kaufman. And I will also say that Michael will um, have to jump off the uh, off our event uh, exactly at 11 and we'll go till uh, 11.30. So Michael Kaufman serves as director of the Russia Studies Program at the CNA Corporation and a global fellow at the Canon Institute. His research focuses on Russia and the former Soviet Union, specializing in the Russian armed forces, Russian military thought and strategy. Previously, he served at National Defense University, advising senior military and government officials on issues in Russia and Eurasia. Michael, please, the floor is yours. Yeah, sure, thank you. Um, and, and thank you for hosting us. So I guess I'll probably start with a very cursory look, at least my impressions from the military side of what's happening in this war from the first two weeks. And, and these are as always early impressions, but um, and our knowledge is very incomplete uh, in part because of the fog of war and, and there's only limited things that you can see. But it looks from the outset that uh, while many, I think, expected, at least those who were predicting the war like me, a large scale Russian military operation in Ukraine. What Moscow actually attempted was a very puzzling operation. It was an effort of quick regime change. They actually hoped and expected to either overthrow Zelensky or get him to surrender within a matter of days. And so the initial military operation, um, I think, defied many local expectations because it was essentially an effort to get troops quickly to the Ukrainian capital, to Kiev and to push forces down into Ukraine, not expecting much resistance. So initial Russian forces went in, they didn't go in a sort of combined arms maneuver formations, expecting a fight. They're trying to skirt around major cities and actually thinking that they were going to avoid substantial resistance. They didn't actually expect the Ukrainian military to put up a fight. Now, well, I think from our point of view, the, the planning assumptions might've been very puzzling, but it's very clear that intellectually, I think the Kremlin had not moved on anywhere since 2014. They essentially were trying to do a much larger version of what had happened in 2014. And there are two other aspects to this operation. The first is they clearly misled the troops. They did not tell the troops they were sending them to war until the very last minute. They told them we're going on exercises. They pushed them to the border, told them not to worry, and then said that they are going to Ukraine, but that this was actually a special operation and that they shouldn't encounter much resistance. And this is why, in the initial 48 hours, if you saw the way Russian forces were operating, you too might have been very puzzled because Russian troops essentially drove into Ukraine as though they were still in their own country. Like they weren't expecting substantial resistance. They simply started driving down the roads. And they started driving down the small detachments. And I'm sure those illusions were shattered when they ran into the first Ukrainian checkpoint or ambush to find out that they were actually in a very real war. And early on, most Russian military power sat on the sidelines. For example, in the first week, we had questions about kind of the missing case of the Russian Air Force. The war started with several hours of cruise missile strikes and ballistic missile strikes. The Russian Air Force basically limited itself to small cases of close air support, meaning there was no major air campaign. There are hundreds of Russian aircraft sitting around Ukraine at air bases, hundreds of Russian combat helicopters. But in the early days, they were largely unused. And it's clear that, that in Moscow, they believed that they actually could succeed in this operation early on without much of a fight, without having to employ this combat power. I have two hypotheses as to why, at least a theory as to why they, they thought they could get away with it. First, uh, they're trying to keep the war secret from the public. They call it a special operation at Donbass for a reason. In the initial week, they were not admitting that this was actually a full-scale invasion of Ukraine. 
they were trying to keep a secret in some ways not similar from the way they were keeping the fighting in 2014 and 2015 secret. They let on that there was some fighting, but they were not trying to characterize the true nature of what they were attempting to do. And if they had used military power and air power on a large scale early on, those images might have, would have been pretty difficult to control. And of course, they quickly cut, shut down what was left of independent media, and they told everybody else that they couldn't even call the war. Literally, they had to call the, a special operation. And the second part is, I think, they hope to avoid some of the worst sanctions from the West. And I, I think they figured they could avoid them if they conducted a quick operation that appeared relatively bloodless, and somehow they sold themselves intellectually on the fact that this was possible. And I think a lot of that had to do with sort of the echo chamber of assumptions inside, in, inside Moscow itself, inside the political leadership. Okay, so they end up with the worst of all worlds. The initial operation was a failure, and it was doomed to be a failure because its assumptions had a little relationship to reality, right? Second, uh, they got the worst of all the sanctions and even far more than they expected in the initial days. They did not reach initial operational success. They got a pretty bad bloody nose early on and, and took uh, some substantial casualties in the early part of the war. And uh, they completely seeded the information domain by trying to keep it secret. So Ukraine, in fact, is winning across the board in terms of shaping the narrative and, and, and so are Western countries to support Ukraine. And only recently have they tried to mobilize the Russian public now in support of the war, realizing that they're in a protracted conflict. All right, what has happened sort of since the initial week? Because we saw around day five, the Russian military start to make significant adjustments. I'll close on this. So having failed an initial operation, they're now trying to reorganize it into a combined arms operation. Okay, there's been a lot of fighting, a lot of attrition. Yes, they've sustained casualties. So have Ukrainian forces who are fighting really hard and particularly leveraging the urban terrain to defend, which strongly favors defenders, uh, since they have you know, far fewer forces available to hold the massive terrain that, that, that ultimately um, the Ukraine represents. It's the largest country in Europe. Um, and Russian forces have made substantial advances, particularly in the South. The rate of advance actually has been quite high. They have a big breakout from Crimea. Those who follow the war know that they're past Kherson, currently trying to work their way out around Nikolaev. They've also encircled Mariupol. They're um, not far from... Uh, Asia, they have been fighting hard around Kharkiv, but their goal had been to go around Kharkiv, not to storm it. And they're slowly trying to envelop it. They broke out past Sumy towards Kiev, also around uh, Cherniev. And as you know, there's a sort of these media stories of the stalled convoy in the north. But they've actually made in the last few days, to tell you the truth, some progress and st steadily encircling Kiev. I don't know if they have enough forces to do that, but it's very clear, at least from my point of view, that Putin is determined. Given the economic crisis resulting from the sanctions, a humiliating loss in this war is, I, I think, will, will, will be politically devastating for the regime. And the two pencers heading towards the Ukrainian capital, I have to tell you, they have ominous vibes of sort of Grozny 1999. Um, you know, Russian forces typically, when, when facing resistance in cities, resort to heavy use of firepower. And you've seen this throughout the war now, particularly in the second week, increasing use of air power increasing use of artillery and the like, especially in urban areas. And you know the devastation that comes with that and a lot of indiscriminate fire. So um, what can we say about where we are today? My personal view is that uh, at this stage, Russian political objectives in this war likely cannot be achieved, right? They're probably stuck resourcing what is ultimately a failed strategy. However, this depends on whether or not they substantially lower the bar for what the initial political objectives were, right, in, in negotiations. Second, they may be able to achieve military objectives. War is highly contingent, all right? Ukrainian forces have fought very hard and have proven very resilient, so that's been very surprising. Both the failure at tactical level of Russian force is surprising and Ukrainian success is surprising, but both sides adapt in the course of the conflict, so as an Analysts, it's my job to introduce some pessimism and temper the initial euphoria from the early days of fighting, because the takeaway is, yes, absolutely, Ukraine can win, but the war is far from over. We are much more towards its beginning than its end. And last part, Russian forces have taken substantial losses, but they've slowly adjusted. I think in the coming weeks, if the fighting continues at this rate, they will, they will potentially be exhausted and they'll need an operational pause or a ceasefire. Okay, that's not going to end the war. All right, ceasefires are organized and resupplied. That may end the very first phase of this war, and the war is potentially going to go on. 
And on Porsche Island, on this note, that uh, it's likely to get uglier as the days go on, and, and, and some of the worst things are probably still yet to come, particularly in terms of urban warfare and siege of cities. Mike, thank you very much. We'll come back to you with questions. And now we're going to hear some remarks from Olena Lennon. Dr. Olena Lennon is an Eastern U Ukrainian native. She's an adjunct professor of political science and national security at the University of New Haven. She teaches courses on US foreign and defense policy and international relations. She also serves as a co-editor of an online scholarly forum, Eyes on Donbass, Politics, Places, and People at the Harvard Ukrainian Research Institute. She's a formerly Fulbright scholar, most recently a Title VIII scholar at the Woodrow Wilson Center's Canon Institute. Olena has dedicated her research to domestic and international politics of Ukraine, as well as Eurasian geopolitics and security writ large. Olena, please, the floor is yours. Oh, thanks so much, Isabella, for that introduction. And thanks, Mike, for your comments. Um, yeah, I'm just going to build on Mike's assessment of operational miscalculations and why I think uh, Putin is not irrational, as, as many people have been claiming that uh, he, he might be rational, but he, he continues to miscalculate. So the escalation that I think we're going to see in the coming days is not going to be so much a function of irrationality, but perhaps a function of further miscalculations. Um, so not only, as Mike said, not only has Putin miscalculated in terms of um, kind of having a quick run on Kiev um, and forgetting that Ukraine is the second largest country by area in Europe after Russia. Uh, it also has the second largest standing army in Europe after Russia. Um, and it has been modernizing its military since 2014. So um, you know, Russia's miscalculation is not only in terms, you know, a function of underestimating the ferocity of the Ukrainian army and, and the resilience that um, both the armed forces and the civilians have demonstrated, but, but also in uh, excuse me, in underestimating the anti-Russia sentiment that had been brewing um, in Ukraine and, and the sort of significant uh, identity transformation that the Ukrainian society had undergone, including in Eastern Ukraine, uh, where you know, Putin was expecting to meet um, a captive audience. Um, ironically, as uh, Putin had been promoting this idea that the Ukrainian state doesn't exist, it is exactly the civic dimension of people's identity uh, in, in you know, around Ukraine, including in Eastern Ukraine, that had intensified in the last eight years. Uh, and numerous polls have sh shown that uh, Ukrainians, um, you know, even though regional differences persist, um, but the, the civic dimension, national identity had intensified so much so uh, that people identify very strongly with the Ukrainian state um, and the protection of the Ukrainian state as, as you know, one of the meanings of being Ukrainian. So ethnicity, language um, have actually um, not mattered as much, especially in the, in the last eight years. Again, uh, counter to what you know, kind of Putin, the idea that had the, he had talked himself into that sentiment had actually intensified the, the civic dimension of the Ukrainian identity. Um, so one of the uh, miscalculations that I want to focus on first. Um, is uh, this idea that um, you know, taking even Eastern Ukraine would be a cakewalk for, uh, for the Russian troops. Um, so the Russians seem to have thought that much like in the occupied territories in, in the so-called republics, uh, where there were initial protests uh, when the Russians came in 2014, um, it, you know, it didn't present uh, a significant problem as uh, the Russian troops squashed the protests, jailed activists and journalists, uh, you know, forced anti-Russia populations out and uh, maintained the optics of legitimacy by claiming that um, you know, Ukrainians might in fact be ready to recapture those territories and uh, perhaps engage in, in genocide against, against Russian speaking populations. So, uh, so the optics of the Ukrainians presenting the, the main threat uh, to Russian speaking populations in, in the Donbass seems to have worked for them, at least to kind of to, to be able to pacify populations. And I think they had assumed um, that perhaps uh, that was going to be the case with the remaining regions of Eastern Ukraine. Um, I think this miscalculation is in large part a function of um, Putin's own delusions, um, echo chambers, chauvinism, and, and yes, uh, Ukrainophobia in a way too. Um, you know, Putin believes in his own version of history and he sort of talked himself into it. Um, so uh, in that way, again, I don't think Putin is irrational. I just think that he is uh, fundamentally 
um, he has significant deficiencies in, um, in information and um, uh, reality on the ground. Um, the other miscalculation uh, that I think is, is in play here is the assumption that um, Ukraine's pro-Western orientation is entirely a function of external Western support, Western propaganda, Western influence, and that once Putin would remove that lifeline uh, from you know, Ukraine, including Eastern Ukraine, uh, that you know, people would sort of stop being pro-Western, that you know, it's not, there's no genuine buy-in uh, that these Western values had been imposed on Ukrainians, and, and that's why um, they seem to be so keen on pro-Western integration. But again, um, given that or not the historical roots of Ukrainian identity, Putin had assumed that was proper military intimidation and was proper sort of economic incentives and security incentives, uh, people could be reconverted back to pro-Russia orientation and, and the pacifying populations would be easier. And again, he miscalculated, miscalculated there um, because, um, you know, the, the, there's a genuine buy-in uh, among Ukrainians um, in terms of uh, geopolitical orientation of Ukraine and including and civic identities, I said before. So not only even the resistance movement, as we have seen so far already in uh, places like Kherson and Militopol uh, that uh, is you know, currently under the Russian control, uh, that I mean, unarmed civilians are actually coming out and protesting against Russian troops. Um, and again, where this is probably not something that Putin had anticipated. Besides, there is a, a growing demographic of IDPs in Ukraine that uh, were forced to move once. And now they're saying that they're not willing to move again. And you know, this is the second time that Putin is forcing them to relocate. Um, and, and, and they're you know, strongly re you know, they're resisting this. Uh, so I, again, there's a new identity dimension there where the uh, former Donbass residents are actually now very um, you know, active participants in the fight. Um, so it seems as though, you know, given the, so this uh, lack of buy-in on the part of populations, um, uh, in, in Eastern Ukraine in particular, it's, it seems as though Russia might have to, um, you know, re-strategize because it, it will not be able to um, uh, control these populations, these areas, without committing a significant military force uh, to, to be able to pacify populations. Um, so the territorial defense forces, again, that uh, seemed to have been underestimated uh, going into this, uh, now we are at about 100,000 volunteers that are uh, that have joined the territorial defense forces around Ukraine. Um, you know, so much so that you know they're actually now turning people away. Uh, they're they're lacking uh, weapons and, and and training facilities to to be able to accommodate um, everybody who wants to join the force. Now, there's not a lot. There are a lot of problems with territorial defense forces too, uh, but these problems are not very well documented or reported. Um, and that's sort of a different problem as far as how you know, the Ukrainians are not necessarily releasing a lot of information about casualties or problems with uh, territorial defense forces because they try to maintain this, the optics of resilience and optimism. In addition, about 16,000 foreigners also joined um, this international legion of territorial defense that Zelensky had advertised and uh, removed you know, any visa requirements requirements for foreigners to, to come and join the force, and, and 16,000 people had taken him up on that. All right, the second miscalculation that I want to talk about has to do with underestimating uh, the level of coordination and political will that the West was going to uh, present, uh, in particular, not only in terms of sanctions, but also in terms of uh, support for Ukraine, ideological, moral, military support for Ukraine, and also the scale of sanctions. I think um, you know, Putin obviously anticipated that uh, you know, sanctions would be dialed up, uh, but perhaps where he miscalculated again was the uh, was in the unity and coordination that in which with which these sanctions had been applied. Um, so the European Union perhaps is one of the biggest surprises here for Putin, as you know, European Union had notoriously been a slow bureaucratic machine, and um, you know it, it has amazingly. Uh, proven to be much more agile and active and more active in foreign policy too than was previously assumed. And, and I think that was also one of the dynam uh, dynamics that Putin had miscalculated. Um, so sanctions, obviously, uh, another miscalculation here 
Um, I'm not an economist, so I'm not going to give any granular details of how sanctions will impact the Russian economy and reverberate around the world. But what's clear is that uh, these are unprecedented, sanction unprecedented sanctions, in fact, with um, in unprecedented consequences, and they're beginning to bite already. I think one of the assumptions, again, on the Russian part was that they would have time to adjust their economy and, you know, um, recalibrate so that they could sanction-proof their economy even further. Uh, but what we're seeing right now with the sanctions that have been applied so, applied so far is that they're already beginning to bite and, and creating uh, all kinds of problems for the Russian economy and uh, domestic discontent uh, within Russia as well. Um, so in addition to sanctioning Russian financial institutions and cutting Russia from the global financial system, as we know, um, several Russian banks have been removed from the SWIFT messaging system. Um, even though Russia had sanction proofed its economy by um, you know, saving up this um, uh, you know, famous uh, rainy day fund um, that they had fallen back on, uh, but the US and EU very quickly moved to prevent the Russian central bank from accessing those emergency reserves. Um, so there was a miscalculation there. Um, also, the new Russia export controls prohibit any export of technology or software, <clears throat> excuse me, to Russia's defense industry, including through Belarus. So these sanctions have been coordinated with Europe, Japan, and other countries. And uh, so these technology restrictions will have uh, more long-term impact, so they may not be felt just yet, um, but obviously this is not looking good for the uh, Russian military and its ability to, to maintain uh, its military power. Um, on top of that, sanctions have also been unleashed on uh, individual oligarchs um, with the idea in mind that you know, they would at some point turn on, on Putin and uh, create um, significant enough pressure on the Kremlin to change his, um, uh, you know, aggression and or to change his tactics at the very least. Um, now, the U.S., the U.K., and the EU so far have sanctioned 16 Russian billionaires uh, by freezing their assets and allowing officials in in London and in the U.S. here uh, to seize their apartments, yachts, private jets, and and other property. Um, most amazingly, even Switzerland, that has uh, you know deep traditions of neutrality, um, and is a, one of the more favored destinations for Russian oligarchs and 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 their financial assets, announced that it would also freeze Russian financial assets and uh, uh, go after Russian oligarchs. Um, so, um, of course, you know, as of yesterday, uh, Biden announced. Um, a ban on imported Russian oil. Uh, while this has long been perceived as um, a, a financial version of a nuclear option, um, a full embargo at this point would probably not be effective unless it includes European countries. While the US you know, could in fact replace this small amount of fuel that it receives from Moscow, uh, Europe obviously cannot um, cut that cord quite as quickly. So it's not clear just yet whether the rest of Europe will actually join uh, this embargo, uh, other than Britain that had just announced that they would try and phase out oil imports from Russia by the end of the year. Um, but as far as I know, I, I haven't checked since yesterday. Uh, nobody else has, you know, jumped on that train yet. Um, now, well, most amazingly, and that's probably where uh, Putin also miscalculated, is that uh, there is a, a great deal of support um, in the West uh, on the part of uh, domestic populations of these sanctions. Um, so according to this one poll that I, that I looked at, uh, more than 80% of Americans support economic sanctions against Russia, and more than 70% uh, are ready to or agree to tolerate higher energy prices in the U.S. Um, if, you know, if these sanctions could be effective in deterring Russia from further aggression in Ukraine. Now, what's important about sanctions, though, and, and one reason in which um, they perhaps, or one reason they may not be as effective down the road um, is that, um, you know, while the main purpose right now is to punish Russia and, and to deter Russia from further aggression, even though uh, deterrence, the deterrence effect of sanctions failed to um, prevent Russian attack on Ukraine or reinvasion of Ukraine, um, but one of the main functions here is also virtue signaling. Um, you know, a lot of people in Russia are now complaining that uh, these sanctions mostly just uh, hurt average Russian citizens, and, and they're correct. Um, but you know, private companies that had pulled out from Russian markets 
are also sig virtue signaling to their audiences. But even the Biden administration is not only signaling to Russia, but signaling to China, Iran, uh, domestic audiences here too, you know, what you know, the capabilities here are on the economic front. So to um, sum up the response of the international community that I think, uh, again, adds to that miscalculation uh, that kind of created this, this disaster for not just for Russia, but for the, the whole community, obviously, more specifically for Ukraine. Um, that will be really hard to, to get out of. But uh, again, I, and I think will lead to further miscalculations, not necessar necessarily irrationality. Um, so one of the uh, uh, more surprising things um, that we have seen so far is, is um, the fact that Biden actually let European leaders take uh, center stage here um, in responding to the aggression in Ukraine. Um, for example, Biden did not announce sanctions against Putin personally until after the EU did, so they, they took the lead on that. Um, the US also joined uh, the, uh, um, in the initiative to cut Russian banks from the SWIFT financial system after the EU announced that decision. Um, Germany was the first one to cancel Nord Stream 2 you know, before the US um, you know, went that way. Uh, so we're seeing um, a, a much, we've seen the European Union playing a much bigger role than had been anticipated, um, not just by Russia, but everybody, even I think the European leaders themselves probably didn't expect that they would be a, um, that would be able to summon so much political will and, and popular buy-in. Um, and on top of that, uh, the United States was also not the, not the first um, country to approve um, direct delivery of Stinger missiles to Ukraine. Uh, the, the U.S. actually uh, started delivering those missiles right, right after Germany um, broke its own rule and announced that they would be transferring uh, this anti-aircraft missiles to, to Ukraine. All right, so um, uh, again, to wrap it up, so some of the things that we have seen that uh, have been unprecedented that have um, added to many surprises that Putin uh, faces right now that you know, are likely to be devastating is that countries are willing to bend their own rules. Um, and that is also a miscalculation. Um, as we have seen so far, um, you know, again, not just the world order has, that's changed, but also um, a lot of um, countries, you know, have changed their domestic uh, rules and procedures to uh, to help Ukraine uh, and to prevent further uh, aggression, maybe a spilling over and and going beyond Ukraine's borders. So, for example, two days after the reinvasion of Ukraine, Germany reversed its historic policy of not sending weapons to conflict zones, and sent anti-tank weapons and anti-aircraft systems to Ukraine. They also authorized the Netherlands to, um, to send um, rocket propelled grenade launchers and, and so on and so forth. So they, um, and most um, perhaps shockingly, uh, Germany had announced that they were going to be, you know, increasing their defense budget and, and um, fortifying their defenses going forward beyond uh, even the, the threshold of 2% required by NATO. Um, also three days after the invasion, the EU for, for the first time decided to fund weapon purchases for Ukraine uh, to help buy air defense systems, anti-take weapons, ammunition, and other equipment uh, to, um, to help uh, Ukraine's armed forces. Um, again, also unprecedented. Um, another unprecedented move that we saw um, on the part of private companies that were leaving Russian markets on their own accord. They didn't even wait for government, government mandate to do so. Um, so we're seeing, so this is mobilization of private companies to, um, uh, to participate in or to change the geopolitical dynamics, um, not only to virtue signal to their audiences, but also I think with a genuine uh, desire to, uh, to do the right thing. Um, also, uh, Finland and Sweden are now um, looking more um, seriously at joining NATO. Um, also, one of the externalities of, of this aggression that I think Russia may not have anticipated. Russia has also been excluded from cultural and sporting events. Um, you know, it was just recently uh, got booted out of the 2022 World Cup qualifying playoffs. What's probably more upsetting to Russia right now is that Poland proceeded automatically. So Poland is gonna advance um, automatically. There's a refugee crisis on the European border. Um, and um, it may not have been anticipated that that the EU, even though obviously 
it, it's, it creates a lot of uh, shock to the EU system. But the European countries have so far stepped up their support and, and uh, assistance for Ukrainians who had fled so far um, by accommodating people, providing financial assistance, and also um, changing some of their legal infrastructure to allow Ukrainians to stay and work in, um, in the EU for up to three years. Um, again, so that level of, of um, receptiveness has also been unprecedented. On top of that, Russia now has to deal with, um, um, you know, it's, it's a pariah state. Um, and, you know, it's not just um, the West that had uh, turned its back on, on Russia, but as we saw in the, in the last uh, General Assembly, the UN General Assembly, of 141 countries that voted on the resolution to condemn Russian aggression, only five voted against, and those include you know, Russia itself, North Korea, Eritrea, Syria, and Belarus. And what's, uh, what's interesting here is that the only post-Soviet country um, that is now, um, you know, that has, um, that backs Russia is Belarus. Um, so- Lena, I'm gonna, I wanna cut in here sure. because I think I wanna switch to, um, uh, Misha Minakov, and then we can come back to you in the question and answer. Absolutely, uh, I was actually, that was my last point. Yes. Perfect, um, okay. Yeah, thank you. We, we thank just you. have so many, I'm watching the list of questions grow, so, so we're gonna shift to that. Okay, so I'm gonna uh, introduce our final speaker, uh, Mikhail Minakov, and just one second, I'm get to his uh, bio, but I also want to um, remind people that if you want to submit your questions, Please submit them via email to canon at wilsoncenter.org, via Twitter at Canon Institute, or on our Facebook page at any time. Please include your name and affiliation when sending your questions. So last but not least, and by the way, I want to mention that all of our three speakers today on today's panel are originally from Ukraine, deeply connected to the country. And this is really the essence of what we do here at the Canon Institute. We provide regional expertise by, by connecting our audiences to experts from the region. So our last speaker is Mikhail Minakov. Um, he is the Canon Institute Senior Advisor on Ukraine and Editor-in-Chief of Focus Ukraine, Canon Institute's Ukraine-focused blog. He's also Editor-in-Chief of the Ideology and Politics Journal. He earned his Master of Arts degree in Philosophy from the Kyiv Mohila Academy and defended his doctoral dissertation at the Kyiv Institute of Philosophy in 2007. For 18 years, he taught at the Department of Philosophy and Religious Studies of the National University of Kyiv Mohila Academy in Ukraine. Ukraine. His main interest is dedicated to political modernization in Eastern Europe, theories and practices of revolutions, political imagine, uh, imagination, and ideologies. Uh, Misha, please. Thank you, Isabella. Well, uh, what we see today is not only the Russian war on Ukraine, it's also something that is more and more often called a patriotic war for Ukraine. It's a uh, cause to defend uh, the country, to defend themselves. And the national uh, resistance that is shown, uh, demonstrated by the army and by Ukrainian society uh, is uh, tremendous. Uh, Michael Kaufman was right saying that this uh, first attack was aiming at the fast uh, regime change. However, it, it failed in many ways due to the unexpected resistance, basically at every level from the military and civilians uh, uh, in, every, uh, in every settlement. Uh, and here the, in the first weeks of uh, this war, uh, the role of President Zelensky is tremendous. Unlike Stalin who disappeared in the first week uh, of the war, or unlike Yanukovych who disappeared from Kyiv uh, and uh, ran away to Russia because of certain danger in Kyiv for him, Zelensky stayed, he refused on many uh, accounts from going to uh, Europe or to the West. And uh, he also became very efficient in raising the uh, spirit of the nation to defend. And this uh, factor is totally unexpected. And as a president in peace times, there, there were a just criticism of his approaches and uh, the professionalism of his surrounding. But now in, in these days, he showed himself 
a great president of war and uh, his communication with Ukrainians, but also with the Western uh, partners is uh, very important and very significant. Uh, if you, well, of course, during the military period, the public opinion works in a very different way, but still in the first week, there was still an opportunity for the polling agencies to understand what is the, the moods on the ground in Ukraine. And uh, we witnessed a huge support for President Zelensky, 91% nationally, uh, with certain regions over 95%. And of course, th there's a huge uh, support for the Ukrainian army. In addition, there's a hope uh, in victory, and this hope remains after two weeks with much stronger uh, and much bigger country. Uh, the, also, you can see that these moods and the, the hope for the victory is also dwelling in the communities that are currently under occupation by Russian army. For example, even today, there was a manifestation with Ukrainian flags and with the pro-Ukrainian uh, slogans in the occupied uh, towns of Berdyansk or Melitopol. However, the new occupation, uh, occupative administrations, they start uh, repressions. Today, it's not entirely checked information, but several sources informed that in Kherson, for example, there are already more than 400 civilians missing who were uh, visible as pro-Ukrainian uh, activists. So in a way, this Rosguardia and the uh, the, the structures that follow the Russian army, they start imposing these restrictive measures and uh, they start uh, controlling over population by very harsh me measures, which will probably become even more severe. Uh, there's a very important uh, issue that there's a huge solidarity between the Ukrainians and the West. Uh, Olena was very right in her analysis of this unexpectedly harsh uh, decisions and sanctions on behalf of EU, for example. They did not expect themselves that it will uh, be that deep or that harsh for Russia. And this miscalculation is also connected both to the role uh, of Zelensky, but also for the, uh, to the developed uh, solidarity between the EU member states and Ukraine. You can look back at 2015, 16, uh, discussions in Netherlands, for example, where they had referendum that would block Ukraine's uh, membership in EU. But still, we, we see that this has changed tremendously by 2022. Uh, and Netherlands and Germany and France are hugely uh, supportive for Ukraine. Uh, and uh, they, this so this solidarity is not rhetorical, it's, it's not something that is pronounced by the leaders in Europe. You can see that out of two or out of over two million uh, refugees that UN uh, says that there are uh, abroad. So we have millions of those who remain within Ukraine and move to the Western Oblast. But these over two million people left Ukraine, mainly women and children who went predominantly to Poland, it's almost a million and a half, then Russia, Hungary, Slovakia, uh, Romania, and, uh, and Moldova. Uh, and you, you literally can see how rank and the refugees, you can see how uh, mayor's offices, city communities create it's special programs. They go uh, with the buses to the border with Ukraine, and they take the the, the people, the, run, the the refugees, and bring them in safe uh, places where they can receive help and some stay uh, in in Europe, deeper in Europe. But still, uh, Ukraine, and after two weeks uh, in the war. There's a growing need in military support, there's need in fuel, and of course there's a need in humanitarian aid. Uh, right now, of the period when we, the agricultural cycle restarts, and I will finish my intervention uh, with uh, this little story from 
my village where, where the farmers came together to discuss uh, how shall they uh, seed the, the crops for the, the new optimism that is, is uh, there with Ukrainians. Uh, there's a fight, there's a war, and there's a need to, uh, to, ha to have new harvest. But in order to get out to that harvest, Ukraine needs support. Ukraine needs uh, as much as support from Western partners. And of course, there's the issue of uh, no-fly zone, which would tremendously help Ukraine. I'll finish with this and we'll be eager to respond to your questions. Misha, thank you very much. So I want to go right away. I have my own questions, but I think I want to go right away to some of the questions that we have from the audience. And I think I want to focus on a couple of questions that are directly uh, that are directed at Mike Kaufman, just because we have he's with us for a limited period of time. Uh, so here's one question from Gerald, Gerald Lawrence. Uh, you correctly saw the buildup of Russian troops along the Ukrainian border as a prelude to an invasion. Do you believe that terrorizing Ukrainian citizens was part of the initial invasion plan? Will the Ukrainians be able to hold Kiev? What kinds of military hardware reinforcements do the Ukrainians need to increase of repelling the enemy attack? Okay, on the first one, no, it wasn't. They actually had pretty tight rules of engagement in the first couple of days. Once they got into the real war, then it became clear that Russian military was going to revert to pretty heavy use of firepower. And the Russian military is very much an artillery army. And it's an army that typically leverages that kind of firepower, especially when it gets into urban warfare. Urban warfare heavily favors the defender. And they don't really have the forces for a lot of urban assaults, which are part of city sieges. So I'm, I'm saddened, but not surprised by what I'm seeing. Uh, and, and I expect it's only going to get worse. But it was clear that initially they didn't plan to use much of the firepower they had. They didn't even go in as organized combined arms formations. You know, they sort of tried to, you know, I, I don't think, in the U.S., we kind of call it a thunder runs and part derivative of some of the things the United States tried to do in 2003 in Iraq. And who knows, maybe Russian military learned all the wrong lessons from 2003 uh, in terms of U.S. operations then. But clearly, they thought they could do this easily without use of most of these capabilities. On other questions, I don't know what's going to happen in Kiev. <laughs> War is incredibly, it's highly contingent. So um, it looks to me like they're going to encircle the city and try to storm it. Parts of it, 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 it I'm seeing this develop over the last two days, frankly, right? Uh, whether or not they'll succeed, the matter's in question. Um, you know, as I was saying, analysis is not fortune telling. And um, uh, these things are pretty contingent. On um, what Ukraine needs, it needs more fighters and it needs more logistics. And it doesn't need fancy things. And it's going to need more air defense soon because it's going to, it has been fortunate that the Russian Air Force did not start with an air campaign to suppress or destroy Ukrainian air defense, okay? They've instead tried to establish pockets of localized air superiority. And the Russian Air Force has paid a, a dear price for that, especially in the past week. That said, over time, Ukrainian air defense will diminish. It'll be down to uh, man portable air defense systems. So that's going to be a bigger issue over time and things like that. Um, but, but I think, I honestly think the West is already supplying as many of these types of capabilities as could be possibly driven into Ukraine at the time. So it's not like this is happening. And I don't like to, I don't like to be a person that suggests we should do the thing that we've already been doing. Right. It's the, it's that, that part's not helpful. Thank you very much. And also a question for you regarding um, the Russian uh, intent and capability to use tactical nuclear weapons. And if they do use them, what would be, what should the US NATO response be? We have this question from a couple of people. Oh, geez. Um, I don't see any Russian intent to use tactical nuclear weapons. So I, I think we need, to, we need to slow down talk of tactical nuclear weapons in general. Um, that being said, you know, there is a chance of a follow on crisis between uh, Russia and the United States or Russia and NATO writ large. We're seeing some initial retaliation response to uh, sanctions, but does kind of very much towards the beginning of it rather than the end. And I am very concerned about that. I'm very concerned about aspects of this crisis that go well beyond Ukraine, that's not specific to what's happening in Ukraine now. That makes sense. Um, 
and yeah, we are we are nuclear powers involved in this crisis. In this so fundamentally, there's always that dimension. Things take place in the shadow of potential nuclear escalation. That's why you know both sides, or not both sides, but at the very least, um, we have to be cautious of those risks and also think about escalation management as as this as this war unfolds. Um, I'm not sure what else to add there. I would only say that I wouldn't overly buy into nuclear signaling as well. Nothing dramatically significant happened with Russian nuclear force posture that we are aware of, okay? It's because Vladimir Putin says something at a meeting, right, and immediately takes up an entire week's worth of news cycle in the press. It has tremendous effects. It's actually highly effective. People in the West, as soon as they hear the nuclear word, ears perk up, right? People begin to wonder, what does it mean? They start asking questions, what's happening in Russian force posture and the like. Uh, but you should be cautious with this, right? It, 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 it is a highly effective instrument, and it's one of the cards that Russia plays very, very regularly. Right? So you be cautious how we interpret nuclear signaling. There's always going to be this dimension of crisis. So I, I always try to urge people not to be alarmist and how they react and whatever expectations they have, but also be understanding that there is fundamentally this dimension, and there always will be to a crisis of this nation. Thank you, Michael. Are there others who would like to uh, chime in on this? Elena, Mikhailo? Well, this mic has to go and, and we'll give him all the time remaining. We can, we can chime no, no, in. I <laughs> Uh, well, I think we should we should uh, broaden the conversation, but I do have one more question that maybe I can address um, uh, to Mike Kaufman, and it's a question from the audience also. Should the NATO support the no-fly zone over Ukraine? I, I don't know. I don't speak for NATO. I don't work for NATO either. So sorry, sorry to give you kind of a, a cop-out answer. Uh, my personal view is that the escalation dynamics are very high. The likelihood of NATO agreeing to it are low. And what it's going to give for Ukraine is actually not all that much, to be perfectly honest, from a practical standpoint. All right. So I think the conversation on the no fly zone has gotten a little bit wrapped around the axle of, of the wrong thing, just to be perfectly frank. And I don't expect that NATO is going to implement the no fly zone. So I don't know what NATO should do, but this is my basic prediction of, of what's likely to happen or not happen. Thank you very much. So I have a question that I want to ask, and I don't know who wants to take it, but it's a question regarding the uh, the Russian dead, the Russian fallen soldiers. And I think it's a crucial question because it's quite possibly the one thing that can change the Russian public opinion. And the numbers obviously vary widely, but the numbers are significant enough, I think, uh, to consider uh, to for them to change public opinion. And so what I'm curious about, do what do we know at this point about uh, what the Russian army is going to do about the dead. Have they, are they picking up the bodies? Are they ignoring the issue completely? Uh, what is the role of the Red Cross? So there's been kind of some reporting, but not nearly enough reporting. And I wonder if any of you know the latest or if any of you know specifics. Well, I was following uh, mainly the open data uh, of the Russian public opinion. And uh, well, I was more than sure, like 75% sure that the, the war will not be launched in this, at least in February, partially, particularly because one of the indi key indicators is preparation uh, of the public opinion in your own country for launching such a massive war. And there you definitely saw that for internal propaganda, there was constant repetition by Putin, by Lavrov, by many other speakers. No, we're not preparing the war now. And uh, uh, then you, you can look at the data in Tseom, this pretty pro-governmental, government-controlled uh, polling uh, agency, and Levada, which is more independent and respectable. And in Levada, they were showing that uh, the, the level was in, in mid February, for example, was rather limited. And there were about 40, 45% of population that would support war in Ukraine. 
Later, I didn't see data from Levada, but in uh, Ceom, they, they show that it's growing rapidly with every day after the launch of the war. And it's over, well over 60. The, the recent data closer to, to 70. So internal propaganda works very well and efficient with the, uh, building Russian support. There's another indicator, uh, which the, the polling agencies don't study. We don't have uh, it, like strong proof of this, but from those uh, leaks that, that there were in, in, in Belarus, we definitely see that uh, the Russian army itself, these attacking groups, they were not prepared. They were constantly uh, told that they are there for military drills and so on and so on, but there was anything connected to preparing also the attacking army to take over Kiev, for example, to bomb people, to kill civilians. And this was also something that was like giving the, the reasons to, to not to foresee this uh, war coming. So uh, Michael was saying that uh, th this was very covered operation. And I think that even middle rank officers did not were not prepared for for launching this uh, attack and uh, also uh, you see that those who do not support uh, the the war in russia it's a very brave young people who mainly from the big cities who go out and who publicly manifest against well in their case it's against the war with ukraine and uh, you, you definitely see that uh, there's a risk, a criminal persecution of this, and still you have thousands of people going out, marching uh, against uh, the, the war and uh, very brutal police actions against them. Also, and I finish with this, uh, the, you can see that cultural elites are split as this famous or infamous letter of the reactors who supported the war but there's also uh, many uh, uh, Russian cultural figures who uh, go publicly uh, against the war and also those who flee, which is also like showing their non-support by, by leaving the country. So it's, it's from my side, thank you. Anybody else? I'll just add um, something that I saw that um, uh, the pro Navalny protests were actually much bigger than anti war protests. So I think very much we're seeing the effects of uh, the Kremlin kind of curating the information environment in favor of denazification, demilitarization of Ukraine that the elites even believe in. And as Misha just said, um, you know, seeing the university rectors actually putting out a public statement in support of denazification of Ukraine um, and commitment to that objective is, is really scary. And as like I said, um, I think what we might see, I'm pessimistic about the whoever um, comes to power after Putin, that we will see a different stance on Ukraine because the way in which the public opinion is conditioned right now is very much in support of, of this being um, a, a, a worthy cause. Um, and was especially now was criminalizing war uh, reporting and a lot of journalists actually leaving the country. I think we're seeing um, a very dangerous dynamic where the Russian information space is only going to be more and more curated and more repressive. Well, that's right. And we can't underestimate the, the, the fact that they have prohibited the use of the word war to describe the war because it's a very different emotional resonance when you call it a special operation versus when you call it a war. So I think that that's, that's really big big difference. I have a question that I think perhaps is for uh, Mike Kaufman again, and it's uh, it's about the, uh, the the so that the, I'll just read it out. So there has been some confusion in Western policy circles regarding the provision of MiG 29s to Ukraine via Poland. By my count, says the person writing the question, there have been at least three reversals regarding this issue. What is the situation at the moment, and what is the background to these policy reversals? I'm not sure. It sounds like the confusion was more in Poland rather than Western policy circles, from what I could tell yesterday. But it um, uh, doesn't sound like everything was uh, fully coordinated there. Uh, from what I recall, um, there was an announcement 
that MiG-29s would be transferred, then the actual nations that hosted these MiG-29s said, no, they weren't going to transfer them. And then yesterday, Poland caught everybody off guard by saying they were going to transfer them to Ramstein. And then on the U.S. side, senior uh, policymakers here in the State Department said that's the first they'd heard of it. And then the Pentagon eventually said that actually that proposal's untenable and they're not moving forward. And that's the last I heard of it yesterday evening. I'm afraid I'm reading this as much as you are. Just because I'm in Washington, D.C. doesn't mean that I can actually use faster. So I'm sorry I can't add more to that conversation. Thank you, Mike. Okay, anybody else on this question? It's very specific. Um, okay, so let me, uh, let's uh, shift to something else. And let's see. Um, okay, so here's, here's a question. When the dust settles, hasn't Putin really achieved his basic goal? There will not be NATO troops in Ukraine and the democratic government of Ukraine will have become ineffective. Will the West tire of the sanctions once they become expensive to their people? Can Russia just wait it out? Well, if I may, uh, it looks uh, so far that the uh, economic, think, financial and economic think tanks, they debate this metaphysical question, what will be the loss for the GDP uh, of Russia? and the, the major consensus is, is it's going to be between seven to to nine percent of GDP in 22. Well, it's a huge blow on, on, on Russian economy. It's comparable or even deeper than the the uh, economic and financial crisis in uh, 2009. However, uh, the, the question is who are the groups that are hit by these uh, sanctions? So far, uh, the, 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 the most probable scenario that the, the blow is to the upper five, from five to 25% of the population. While the people from smaller towns and from rural areas, from provincial Russia will be uh, less impacted. And if that's true, then th there will be some uh, support to Putin, or he can at least try to to gather this support there, and uh, it could provide a regime with some legitimacy. However, it's important that uh, during this Putin's uh, rule, there were like two social contracts, one with the population, you rank and file citizens, get your income for your households, and you will be economically well off in exchange for uh, your political rights. And you will be defended socially and from criminality. Right now, this contract is most probably be broken. There's definitely be, well, maybe not as big as for the richer Russians, but still there will be a, a blow on uh, simple Russians, on, on middle class and lower classes. And uh, this flow of criminality that is always connected with the military actions. So it's uh, getting ruined there. And also the contract with elites. Elites were not involved in this decision-making and sanctions are killing their wealth. You literally can see that every week is uh, Forbes list people are losing half of their wealth. And it uh, seems to, to be continued, especially in the in those zones where they were uh, bringing their capitals from Russia. So both show that probably the Russian elites will change their opinion much faster than the Western elites. Yes, Western uh, economies, especially those that were connected to the, or dependent on the trade with, with Russia, will lose from one to 3% of their GDP this year. However, uh, again, there's, much more, well, Russia is uh, less strong and uh, less resilient to these sanctions. So we should expect some changes within Russia. If I may just add quickly um, to what Misha just so eloquently Please. explained, um, you know, Putin's entire uh, popularity and his, his image, his legacy is based on the fact that he 
uh, saved Russia from the turbulent 90s, 90s that he brought economic stability to Russia. So I think that very image uh, of economic stability is being challenged right now. And that's why I think Putin, strategically, Putin has already lost um, because his political objectives did not match uh, military operation and its ability to achieve those objectives and did not match understanding of the operational environment because he underestimated uh, the West, Ukraine, and his own populations. And in that way, um, he has to choose a different strategy because the strategy that he had uh, set out to pursue has already failed. Um, and um, I don't see how uh, Putin can reinvent himself at this point. It will take uh, something truly transformative. Um, and, you know, I, I really don't see any, um, any future here for Putin to try and kind of reinvent that image of uh, economic stability as under the current sanctions, I don't think there's any economic stability uh, in, in the, um, um, in, in, on the agenda or in, in the immediate future. Um, so, yeah. Well, you know, it's interesting because I've been having some conversations in recent days about how, how will the Russian propaganda explain what's happening? How will, exp how will it explain the sanctions? Because right now, most Russians don't have access to an alternative point of view, right? As they've closed down, shut down all the remaining independent media outlets, uh, somehow they will have to, the state television, state propaganda will have to explain it. And I think that the way they, the, the narrative they will turn to is that, well, look, we told you, uh, it's the West. The West hates Russia. The West tries to undermine Russia. And it's, uh, it's the West's fault. So I think that this is the, the narrative they will turn to. And we actually have a, a question uh, from the audience on this. Is, is Russia's control over the media so heavy that there is really no way to get around uh, the, the prohibitions? So I have my own opinions about it, but I wonder if maybe Misha and Elena, you can comment on this. How would ordinary Russians actually be able to tell that they are not, uh, that, they are, that they are being sold uh, a bill of goods that it's just not working that they that what they're hearing on tv and what they're experiencing in real life that the diff, the gap between that is just too big and they no longer buy the explanations what will what will happen then and how, how will they find out and what will happen then once they find out well of course it would be good to ask maxim trudelubov for example that question and uh, he yes. writes a lot uh, on, on that issue. Well, historically, we know that contemporary Russian society uh, have survived 1990s in, in very harsh conditions. However, it was socially and economically difficult, but the, the freedom of press and political freedoms were still there. Uh, they will start disappearing uh, at a later stage. So uh, in a way, it's a, a new uh, condition and highly, uh, it's, it's very difficult to predict them. And uh, neither Kremlin nor, nor us can uh, actually have more or less uh, grounded uh, hypothesis about this. But it's definitely a gray zone with huge risks for the uh, Kremlin regime. And uh, I agree with Elena, it's the beginning of the end of this regime in any way, because the, the, this, this type of authoritarianism that was provided in Russia since 2012, and which became very uh, toxic after 2014 with all this Crimean toxicality, right now it has to turn uh, to make the same uh, autocratic turn, which took place like two years ago in Belarus. So it should become highly repressive authoritarianism, not just media-based, but also repressions. And here, this institution that was developed recently will have a new role, that's uh, Rosguardia. Uh, but would it be enough to control such a huge country uh, and uh, such a unloyal, now un unhappy elites, uh, I, I rather doubt. So I think that after breaking the contract with elites, Putin have signed up the, the 
his the, the end the contract about the end of his regime but how soon here i can't say great so let me uh let's switch to the question of uh, or shift to the question about the foreign fighters in ukraine uh as well as uh chechen uh, as well so so foreign fighters who are fighting on behalf of ukraine and also chechens fighting for russia what uh, perhaps what 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 is the impact of these forces on both sides? And uh, the question from our, one of our viewers is: Could we see consequences in the future uh, from their participation, as we have seen with foreign fighters in the Middle East and Afghanistan? Who would like to take this question? Um, no, I'm, I'm willing to um, give it a shot. So I think right now the, the main value of foreign fighters in Ukraine is definitely in boosting morale and creating that spiritual uh, moral support that uh, contributes to Ukrainian resilience. Um, I don't think that they're decisive on the battlefield just yet, um, you know, mainly because, you know, while we're beginning to see the, the beginnings of urban warfare when, you know, fight comes to the city, and it's going to get really violent in you know, the street to street fighting. And that's where, uh, you know, potentially we might even see, um, you know, some casualties as well, um, which is sort of one of the uh, conditions that one part of the contract is that people agree uh, to these, um, um, you know, risks, obviously. But um, right now, um, I don't think they're, again, they're, they're contributing as much to uh, sort of the the combat power of Ukraine's armed forces so much as they are really uh, instrumental in maintaining that level of um, morale and and resilience and fighting spirit, knowing that the West is is backing uh, the, the Ukrainian cause that they're that they're fully supportive of uh, Ukraine's in you know, a fight for its freedom. Um, so I don't know how things are going to be developing going forward. Probably not well. Again, once you know if. Um, in the next few days, you know, the Russian troops actually uh, close in on Kiev, and we will see urban warfare on a scale unseen yet. Uh, I think we'll have to revisit this question of, you know, how um, these foreign fighters are, are going to be changing the, the, the actual battlefield outcomes. Well, today we uh, hear the, the Chechen issue popping up all the time, and I've would like to say that most probably the experience of uh, Chechen wars that lasted from 94 to 2008, uh, this period uh, and the, the military specialists, military officers, generals who were educated in this war in Russia, they will become more and more important right now in, in Ukraine. And that's something that really is a tragic thing, but Ukraine becomes the, the battlefield also for two groups of Chechen fighters coming. From, you see more and more propaganda uh, bringing about the, the Kadyrov's uh, fighters coming from Chechnya and also the Zakayev's uh, networks from, from the West. So many volunteers, Chechen volunteers from the West are coming to fight on the Ukrainian side. And here you, you, you can imagine also the, the fights between two groups of the Chechens on, on the territory of Ukraine. However, my major point would be that what is more important is that Ukrainian regular army was very much developed. And this is the regular army that stopped the uh, Russian uh, intrusion. And uh, this is what uh, changed the all the plans of, of the Kremlin in the first three days of the war. And also, we would need support. Well, it, it's very important to have the, the, the solidarity with other peoples also in terms of volunteers coming, but we need uh, regular army support, so NATO support. And that, that's where the, the uh, victory for Ukraine uh, could be. Uh, the informal groups and the, the, the data already there's a Ukrainian official sources saying that it's already up to 40,000 uh, international fighters. And the geography is very different. Again, uh, I'm using, I'm citing official sources. So uh, it's uh, 
British uh, veterans, uh, German veterans, uh, Polish veterans, Albanian veterans. There's also information from Turkish uh, media that uh, Turkomans from Syria are expected to come. So you see that many different uh, veterans are coming in Ukraine. And I think if uh, Ukrainian regular army can use these resources, that would be important. But if it's go, it goes informally, it, it creates some additional problems maybe. Uh, anyway, you can see that uh, the international uh, support comes to Kyiv and it's hugely important. I, today, earlier this morning, I talked to people from Kyiv who were saying, oh, we saw the British volunteers and it cheers up the community a lot. I uh, received a, a message from Dnipro saying that they saw some uh, Polish guys there. It also creates this feeling of solidarity with, uh, with the West. So uh, I'm sure that Ukrainians are very thankful for this support, but we need regular army support. Thank you so much. So I'll remain, uh, remind our listeners, if you would like to ask a question, uh, please submit it via email to canon at wilsoncenter.org, via Twitter at Canon Institute, or on our Facebook page at any time. Please include your name and affiliation when sending your questions. We have a question from Ambassador George Kroll, who's asking, how long can Ukraine, the Ukrainian government and society schooling healthcare governing last until uh, under continuing war conditions? How is Ukraine adapting or can adapt to the situation that affects the daily life of nearly every citizen in Ukraine? Well, it's difficult. Uh, it's a difficult issue. A couple of days ago, there was a message from the Minister of Education that we should return to educational processes where possible on the March 14, so in a week. But now many directors, principals of the schools or rectors are raising this issue about postponing. So most probably it will be postponed. It's uh, in the uh, battle zones, of course, there's no, no educational process. Also in those cities that are under shelling, you definitely you hear more and more often these uh, sirens when uh, kids and uh, personnel should hide in shelters. So it's probably in this phase of the, the war, probably unwise to have this educational process. I know that uh, on many instances, for example, in Kharkiv, in shelters or in Kyiv in shelters, there, there are attempts of cultural, uh, cultural activists, educational activists, professors uh, to give some lectures, to organize debates, uh, even have some little shows, uh, spectacles, which is uh, important for, you know, for resilience of, of the community. But it, of course, it's it's sporadic and it's not, not yet uh, possible to return to normal life. That's answer from me. I think I, I agree with Misha, but I also think it might be uh, you know premature yet to uh, let the guard down and uh, sort of signal to Ukrainian populations that life could resume, uh, you know, business as usual because you know we're still seeing um, a lot of kinetic activity activities throughout Ukraine, you know, the, the Russians are still advancing, they're still, it seems as though they're still trying to link up um, around Kiev. Uh, so I, I think the situation is still quite dynamic. Um, I would say that, um, you know, it's important for the Ukrainian government right now, as much as, you know, it's important to keep the morale up, but it's also important to be transparent and fully um, realistic about how quickly we can return to normal. Um, I know that they're trying to keep everybody in the country and, and kind of sustain this resistance movement, not everybody, but encourage people to uh, participate in the resistance movement. And I, and I think it's laudable, but at the same time, I, I think it's also important to be um, realistic about, um, you know, how quickly we can, you know, at least resume some sort of, you know, normal activities up, up until at least a real ceasefire can be a, can manifest itself. I, I think we're moving in that direction right now because the Russian forces obviously had been humiliated and they're, you know, they have supply problems, they have morale problems, the Russian troops are demoralized. Um, and I, th I think that it's looking like they, they may be looking for a ceasefire too in the coming days. 
um, not least to you know resupply, reorganize, uh, hopefully to re-strategize too, and actually maybe uh, you know calibrate some of their objectives as well. Um, you know, given that the the initial objectives had failed, obviously. Um, so I I would sort of caution the Ukrainian government and the, the people to not rush this normalization um, and wait for uh, a real ceasefire. Uh, that could allow, you know, evacuation of civilians or maybe a presumption, you know, resuming some normal activities, um, whether it's uh, planting um, for the new harvest season or schooling or, or whatever the case might be. But I think it's 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 a little too soon to um, to, to to be kind of rushing that. Thank you, Olena. And kind of on this note. Um, we have a question which I think interests uh, a lot of us uh, is, uh, and this is, uh, what do you think would be a conception of victory that would allow Putin to end the campaign in, in a negotiated settlement with Ukraine? And would this be acceptable to the Ukrainian government? In other words, what, what could be the end game for Putin? At which point he is satisfied that he has achieved his objectives or he can declare, I don't know, declare victory at home and end this? Misha, you want me to go first? Um, so, so far, I haven't seen any signs of Putin backing down from the initial objective of um, basically uh, denying a Ukrainian um, statehood and, and sovereignty. Uh, the last time I, I the, the last three requirements that Putin had put forward included changing the constitution of Ukraine to where it would officially become a neutral country and, and forswear its ambitions to join NATO and the EU. Uh, number two, recognizing Crimea as, as Russia's. And number three, recognizing the, the republics as, as fully independent. And Zelensky said, you know, that was, it was a non-starter. So we're, you know, we're still exchanging, the Ukrainians and, and the Russians are still exchanging ultimatums. Um, it, the signals that I'm reading from the Ukrainian side um, are such that they are stalling for time, uh, hoping that uh, you know that there may be a change in the uh, in inside Russia to where Putin's strategic objectives in Ukraine become so unpopular that he will be facing increasing pressure to um, to kind of scale back and and um, uh, you know actually sit down at the negotiating table for real negotiations, not for the exchange of ultimatums. Um, so, but I think one thing that remains clear now is that the initial campaign had failed. Um, and that denying Ukraine its statehood is, a, is unachievable. So that's a failed objective. So the Russians are forced to, will be forced to uh, go from there to recalibrate um, and negotiate, uh, like you said, so come up with some negotiated settlement. I think we're gonna see uh, continued support for Ukraine in terms of defensive capabilities. You know, the, uh, the West continues to uh, resupply Ukraine with anti-aircraft and the tank missiles. Um, so in that way, I, I think they, there are some positive dynamics in terms of Ukraine, Ukraine's ability to sustain further attacks. Um, but I do think that realistically, um, we're not going to see any negotiated settlement until a few ceasefires down the road. So we're going to, I think the first step is to negotiate ceasefires that will uh, be contingent on, you know, safe corridors for civilians. And, and things of that nature, and only those sort of series of ceasefires will hopefully create a break in, in, the, uh, in the peace process itself. Um, but I think, again, uh, the, the one thing that we can already count on is the fact that, um, that Russia, there, there's no way that Russia can um, control the entire Ukraine. So that, one, that much is clear, uh, that Ukrainian, Ukraine will um, persist in, in its... Um, um, in its, obviously, in its ambitions to be independent and sovereign and make geopolitical decisions as they wish. Um, last time I saw they were trying to, Zelensky signaled uh, perhaps a different security arrangement, not NATO, but perhaps a, a, a different sort of a alignment of forces that would create a different alliance, a security alliance that Ukraine can fall back on. Um, so there's, there are some creative solutions being considered right now, but you know, I think we're likely to see a, a several ceasefires first um, before any uh, constructive talks begin. I would also like here uh, to add an important issue that, well, first of all, uh, 
there is internal contradiction in, in uh, recent statements made by Putin. On one side, he continues insisting on, on those three, uh, three aims that in his language are called uh, denazification, demilitarization, and neutralization of Ukraine. So uh, all these three aims are uh, sort of demands from uh, President Zelensky and Ukrainian parliament, because it's them together who can uh, agree or disagree on these uh, aims. And at the same time, he was not willing, uh, openly saying, he was not willing to uh, call for mass mobilization and increasing uh, the, the number of Russian soldiers uh, participating in the war against Ukraine. So if uh, Michael Kaufman is correct, and he says that uh, Putin is determined to take over Kyiv and the central Ukraine, if that's the case, then this mass mobilization is inevitable increase of uh, the, the, the army and the uh, technical, military technical uh, equipment is necessary, is a must. And most probably uh, Kremlin will need to pressure Minsk in order to participate in the war, even though Belarusian army is not big and tested in any war, but still it's another hit on Ukraine. So, uh, if uh, this determination is true, and it will be the leading uh, contradictory uh, aim in, in, in this agenda, in Putin's agenda, then we should expect also something that he pronounced recently in his recent statement, public statement, that there won't be any political entity such as Ukraine. So this first set of uh, goals were connected with Ukraine being neutral, we, and uh, Ukraine recognizing the loss of certain territories. And if not, now he's raising those stakes, uh, there, there will not be Ukraine uh, in his plans. This is a huge danger. It's existential danger for Ukraine as a nation and as a state. Uh, right now we have several tracks, at least two visible tracks where uh, the, the talks are going on and they're going on uh, uh, mainly between the uh, cabinet, Zelensky's administration and Zelensky's cabinet. So the first track, uh, these are the meetings of uh, commission of politicians from the presidential team who go and meet with their uh, Russian colleagues on, on the soil of Belarus. And at this level, they already started like doing, uh, having some effect in terms of humanitarian corridors. They are not working well, they, they are not organized and, and the, the, there are many limitations, but slowly they learn how to communicate and uh, also uh, create some safe corridors, at least for, for people, refugees from Sumy, for example, for two days it worked for the first time. And it's the result of this track. The second track will uh, start working tomorrow in Antalya in Turkey, where uh, it's gonna be the first time since the war started when two ministers of foreign affairs will meet. So Mr. Kuleba and Mr. Lavrov will have uh, to start this, this kind of track discussions. There are also uh, several invisible tracks and we have only elements and bits of this. So, you see some activity of uh, Prime Minister Bennett from Israel. You can see uh, some uh, activities of uh, less official people like business per per persons who once were, uh, once were uh, invited to Kremlin, for example, and in the Western. There's also communication between President Macron and Chancellor uh, Scholz with the Kremlin, but this is not yet an organized process. Of course, what we need to expect is a big diplomatic conf conference on peace for Ukraine and also for the system of security, something like Helsinki too, but it's a very big future, uh, not yet here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Misha. And we have uh, just five minutes left. And I think in these five minutes, I want to ask, uh, we have we have some questions that are asking um, uh, about the broader implications.
implications of this crisis, broad, broader geopolitical implications of this crisis. And so there are two questions relating to China and Taiwan, and I wonder if you would feel comfortable giving us your opinion about that. So one question is, what are the likely effects of the crisis on China's aspirations towards Taiwan? Taiwan? Would they seek to capitalize on the instability or be deterred by the political and economic backlash faced by Russia? So that's number one. And the second question is, given the initial US reluctance to use full sanctions against Russia, if China were to invade Taiwan, would the US sanction, would the US sanction China to the same degree, especially given the much more extensive trading ties the US has with China? Well, strategically, uh, we should expect the, the conflict between China and uh, United States and the United States allies. That's something almost inevitable in the future. Uh, still, I think or I hope that this uh, launch of the war by Russia uh, will, will give the lesson to other Asian nations who are waiting for the growing westlessness of the world order, uh, to other non-democratic countries that now learn from Russia what's going on. So this preemptive, uh, non-prepared military adventure by uh, Putin will backlash, and maybe it will show the lessons that West is not disunited, it's strong, and democracies can cooperate and punish dictators. That's a very important uh, lesson. Having that said, I also see that uh, when you follow statements of officials uh, from Beijing, the, the preparations for the takeover of uh, Taiwan is in place. Uh, also, let's remember that uh, Comrade C was uh, elected as, uh, as a, well, he's elected in a special position. It's the third time this position is used. In Russian, it's called Veliki uh, Kornchi. I'm not sure what's the, the English term for it, but that's a, something unusual, which was assigned to Mao, then it was assigned to Deng Xiaoping. And they both uh, had this special mission as the leaders of China first had to create the red China, the second had to create rich China, and uh, the, this new uh, assignment for uh, Comrade C is basically that uh, China should become a global power. And putting this together, it shows that China may wait a bit longer. Now that Russia is punished so much, I'm not sure, that those economic difficulties that China has now, they are ready to, to face the further impoverishment and social uh, problems. But in future, we should expect China being uh, in conflict with uh, global democracies. Go ahead, Anne. Uh, yeah, I'll just add that I agree that long term, um, China is definitely a well positioned here to um, uh, to become a global leader. And, and China has long been concerned with uh, U.S. hegemony, dollar hegemony, um, and especially since the, the trade war um, with the U.S. Um, and it, it also found an ally in the Kremlin, especially after uh, the initial sanctions of 2014. Uh, but at the same time, two things here. We're not necessarily seeing uh, the, the same um, sort of level of um, the, the Chinese-Russian cooperation or the improvement in the relationship that everybody had anticipated, because as, as much as the two countries share a lot in common um, and they sort of find support in each other, it, it will continue to be a pragmatic relationship and, and one in which, um, again, pragmatism will prevail. China has not necessarily embraced Russia uh, post these sanctions. So it's also being very cautious. Russia is toxic and China has been very, very cautious about sort of re-embracing Russia um, uh, given all the hardship that it has experienced. So I think uh, that China is going to try and wait it out um, and wait until the, the, the global economy stabilizes a little bit. Uh, but ultimately, it is positioned to you know, sprint ahead of everybody. Um, but I think I would sort of conclude on that note that we should not necessarily see um, that uh, level of integration and, and cooperation between Russia and China that everybody had predicted. I think China is going to keep us a, a good distance away from Russia. 
um, you know, given its toxicity um, and uh, continue sort of taking advantage of the undermining of or of trade with Russia without using dollars because they're now trying, finding other ways to, to trade and sell oil and gas. Um, so um, I don't think it will, China will help Russia as much as, as a lot of people had predicted. So Russia will continue um, you know, crippling, its economy is gonna continue to cripple. Uh, and I do think that the possibility of China invading Taiwan is very high, but not in the short term, not in the near future. I think that a lot, too unstable right now because the, the entire global economy is in disarray and that concerns China as well. Olena, Mikhail, I want to thank you very much. I want to thank Mike Kaufman who had to leave early. This was a really excellent discussion. I'm very grateful uh, to, you, to you taking the time uh, to join us. I want to thank our listeners. Uh, please go to our website. Please read our blogs. Please sign up to get our updates follow us on social media, and we will see you next time. Thank you all so much.